Well, good morning, and what a beautiful morning it is. It is Thursday, April 9, 2020, which means that today, according to some church traditions, is Maundy Thursday, referencing the fact that if our church calendars are correct, this is the day in which Jesus met with his disciples, washing their feet and observing the Last Supper. Now, for those of us who are part of church traditions that don't follow a church calendar, this is still a day that we ought to spend meditating upon this work of Christ. And to that end, I wanted to introduce you to a book that maybe you've never heard of before. It is John Murray's book, Redemption Accomplished and Applied. Right now, on Kindle, it is $1.59. So if you have a Kindle, you need to get this book. Even if you don't have a Kindle, you ought to get it. I remember being at a pastor's conference with a friend of mine talking to Sinclair Ferguson and asking him about books that we ought to read. And he asked us with that thick Scottish accent of his, Have you read Murray's Redemption Accomplished and Applied? And we admitted that we had not. Um, and he said, Well, until you have worked through that book, you have not done theology. And so, of course, uh, when we returned home, that's the first thing we did was we bought that book and worked through it together to our great profit. And so I want to share with you some thoughts from the first chapter, which I think will be of encouragement to you. Mary starts the book by talking about the atonement, the work of redemption, the work that Christ did to accomplish our salvation. And he says this is the central uh, piece, the central teaching of Christianity. But he asks, where does it come from? What is its source? And he takes us to John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever, whosoever should believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And he says right there we see that the source of this atoning work is the love of God. And of course we know that God is love. It is his nature to love. But Murray asks, well, that being the case, does that mean that God loves everyone indiscriminately? And he says, no, God's love is a discerning love. Um, he does not show the same love to everybody. And of course, that just uh, makes sense. So you just logically, if you think it through and you, you read the scriptures and turn to places like Romans 9, Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated, uh, the way that uh, God approached Pharaoh was much different than the way that he approached the Israelites. But where Mary takes us to is Ephesians chapter 1. And I can read, starting in verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the Beloved. And so Murray takes us to that passage and says, we see here that God's love is a discerning love. Even though his nature is the love, there's nothing that compels him to show love to anybody, let alone you or me. And so the fact is that if God has shown us his love, it's because he has freely chosen to bestow it upon us. That alone is of great encouragement. But then he says, once he's decided to show that love, did it have to take the form of the sacrifice of Christ? Why did it require the shedding of blood? Couldn't it have come in another way? And he admits that anytime we begin to ask questions about what God could have or uh, could did not have to do that we could run into some dangerous territory. So he said the best thing for us to do is just to consider the scriptures and see, do they seem to indicate that the shedding of the blood of Christ was the only way for God to show us his great love for us? And his answer is yes. And then he takes us back to passages like John 3.16, over to Hebrews, especially chapters 2, a, a great deal um, of time is spent in Hebrews chapter 9, and he says, in each of these places, it seems to indicate, or it does indicate, matter of fact, that there was no other way for God to show us his love than through the shedding of the blood of Christ. And then he meditates upon the fact that there needed to be judgment upon the sin of mankind, and there was none other that could bear that judgment but Christ himself, that there was need for righteousness. Um, if we were going to stand before a holy God, we could not do it apart from being righteous, and the only righteousness that would do would be that of Christ. 
and that the cross is presented to us in the scriptures as the preeminent, the ultimate form of God's love, demonstration of God's love. And he says, well, if God did not have to send Jesus to die upon the cross, could it really be said to be the uh, greatest manifestation of love? And he says, no. And so the result is that we've got to conclude that the only way for God to show us his great love for us was through the shedding of the blood of the Son of God. And so the conclusion of the matter, which I think is of great encouragement, is this that God did not have to show us his love. He did not have to give it to us. But once he decided to, the only way he could do it would be by sending his son to die upon the cross through the shedding of his blood. And that he chose to do. I hope that is of great encouragement to you this day and that the Lord will be blessing you throughout the remainder of this week.